Dear fellow human, I think by now you are sensing that something does not seem right. But I also think that poorly argumented conspiracy theories have caused you to stay far from the fear-mongering media and conspiracy theorists alike. But please listen, because as you are watching, millions fall into poverty because of the corona measures of the past year. Even if the greatest economic crisis in history has not affected you yet, it will only be a matter of time until the rippling effects will hit you as well. This is not veermongering, but it's a harsh reality. I also think we might mitigate the damage and may even do better provided we are informed correctly about our situation. This is why I would like to show you a few facts you can easily check, facts that are of crucial importance. Less than a handful of big corporations dominate every aspect of our lives. That may seem exaggerated, but from the breakfast we eat to the mattress we sleep on and everything we wear and consume in between is largely dependent on these corporations. Those are huge investment companies that determine the course of money flow. They are the main characters of the play that we are witnessing. I know your time is valuable, so I summarized the most important data. How does it work? Let's take PepsiCo as an example. It is the parent company of many soda companies and snack companies. The so-called competitive brands are from factories from a few corporations who monopolize the entire industry. In the packaged food industry there are a few big companies, like Unilever, the Coca-Cola company, Mondelez and Nestle. In the picture you see that most brands in the food industry belong to one of these corporations. The big companies are on the stock market and have the big shareholders in the board of directors. On sources like Yahoo Finance we can see detailed company info such as who the biggest shareholders actually are. Let's take PepsiCo again as an example. We see about 72% of stock is owned by no less than 3,155 institutional investors. These are investment companies, investment funds, insurance companies, banks and in some cases governments. Who are the biggest institutional investors of PepsiCo? As you can see, only 10 of the investors own together nearly one third of the stock. The top 10 of investors together amount to a value of $59 billion. But out of those 10, only 3 own more stock than the other 7. Let's remember them and look up who owns the most stocks of the Coca-Cola company, the biggest competitor of Pepsi. The biggest lump of stock is again owned by institutional investors. Let's look at the top 10 and start at the bottom 6 of them. Four of these institutional investors we also saw at the bottom six of PepsiCo. These are Northern Trust, JP Morgan Chase, Geode Capital Management and Wellington Management. Now let's look at the four biggest stock owners. They are BlackRock, Vanguard and State Street. These are the world's biggest investment firms. So PepsiCo and Coca-Cola are not competitors at all. The other big companies that own a myriad of brand names like Unilever, Mondelez and Nestle are from the same small group of investors. But it's not only in the food industry that their names come up. Let's find out on Wikipedia which are the biggest tech companies. Facebook is the owner of WhatsApp and Instagram. Together with Twitter, they form the most popular social media platforms. Alphabet is the parent of all Google companies like YouTube and Gmail. But they are also the biggest investor in Android, one of the two operating systems for nearly all smartphones and tablets. 
The other operating system is Apple's iOS. If we add Microsoft to the above three, we see four companies making the software for nearly all computers, tablets and smartphones in the world. Let's see who are the biggest shareholders of these companies. Take Facebook. We see that 80% of the stock is owned by institutional investors. These are the same names that came up in the food industry. The same investors are in the top three. Next is Twitter. It forms with Facebook and Instagram the top three. Surprisingly, this company is in the hands of the same investors as well. We see them again with Apple and even with their biggest competitor, Microsoft. Also, if we look at other big companies in the tech industry that develop and make our computers, TVs, phones and home appliances, we see the same big investors that together own the majority of the stock. It's true for all industries, I'm not exaggerating. One last example, let's book a holiday. On a computer or a smartphone we search for a flight to a sunny country on Skyscanner or Expedia. Both are from the same small group of investors. We fly with one of the many airlines, many of which are in the hands of the same investors and of governments, as is the case with Air France KLM. The plane we board is in most cases a Boeing or an Airbus, also owned by the same names. We book through Booking.com or Airbnb and when we arrive we go out for dinner and place a comment on TripAdvisor. The same big investors show up in every aspect of our trip. And their power is even bigger because of the kerosene is from their oil companies or refineries. The steel from which the plane is made comes from their mining companies. This small group of investment firms and funds and banks are namely also the biggest investors in the industry that dig for raw materials. Wikipedia shows that the biggest mining companies have the same big investors that we see everywhere. Also the big agricultural businesses on which the entire food industry depends. They own Bayer, the parent company of Monsanto, the biggest seed producer in the world. But they are also the shareholders of the big textile industry. And even many popular fashion brands who make the clothing out of the cotton are owned by the same investors. Whether we look at the world's biggest solar panel companies or oil refineries, the stocks are in the hands of the same companies. They own the tobacco companies that produce all the popular tobacco brands, but they also own all big pharmaceutical companies and the scientific institutions that produce medicine. They own the companies that produce our metals and also the entire car, plane and weapon industry, where a great deal of the metals and raw materials are used. They own the companies that build our electronics, they own the big warehouses and online markets, and even the means of payment we use to buy their products. To make this video as short as possible, I only showed you the tip of the iceberg. If you decide to research this with the sources I just showed you, then you will see that most popular insurance companies, banks, construction companies, telephone companies, restaurant chains and cosmetics are owned by the same institutional investors we have just seen.
These institutional investors are mainly investment firms, banks and insurance companies. In turn, they themselves are owned by shareholders. And the most surprising thing is that they own each other's stocks. Together they form an immense network comparable to a pyramid. The smaller investors are owned by larger investors. Those are owned by even bigger investors. The visible top of this pyramid shows only two companies whose names we have often seen by now. They are Vanguard and BlackRock. The power of these two companies is beyond your imagination. Not only do they own a large part of the stocks of nearly all big companies, but also the stocks of the investors in those companies. This gives them a complete monopoly. A Bloomberg report states that both these companies in the year 2028 together will have investments in the amount of 20 trillion dollars. That means that they will own almost anything. Bloomberg calls BlackRock the fourth branch of government because it's the only private agency that closely works with the central banks. BlackRock lends money to the central bank, but it's also the advisor. It also developed the software the central bank uses. Many BlackRock employees were in the White House with Bush and Obama. Its CEO Larry Fink can count on a warm welcome from leaders and politicians. Not so strange if you know that he is the frontman of the ruling company. But Larry Fink does not pull the strings himself. BlackRock itself is also owned by shareholders. Who are those shareholders? We come to a strange conclusion. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard. But now it gets murky. Vanguard is a private company and we cannot see who the shareholders are. The elite who own Vanguard apparently do not like being in the spotlights. But of course they cannot hide from who is willing to dig. Reports from Oxfam and Bloomberg say that 1% of the world together owns more money than the other 99%. Even worse, Oxfam says that 82% of all earned money in 2017 went to this 1%. Forbes, the most famous business magazine, says that in March 2020 there were 2,095 billionaires in the world. This means that Vanguard is owned by the richest families in the world. If we research their history, we see that they have always been the wealthiest. Some of them even before the start of the Industrial Revolution. Because their history is so interesting and extensive, I will make a sequel. For now I just want to say that these families, of whom many are in royalty, are the founders of our banking system and of every industry in the world. These families have never lost power, but due to an increasing population they had to hide behind firms like Vanguard, of which the stockholders are the private funds and non-profits of these families. To clarify the picture I have to explain briefly what non-profits actually are. These appear to be the link between companies, politics and media. This conceals the conflicts of interests a bit. Nonprofits, also called foundations, are dependent on donations. They do not have to disclose who their donors are. 
They can invest the money in the way they see fit and do not pay taxes as long as the profits are invested again in new projects. In this way, non-profits keep hundreds of billions of dollars among themselves. According to the Australian government, non-profits are an ideal way of financing terrorists and of massive money laundering. The foundations and funds of the families that are the richest stay in the background as much as possible. For issues that get much attention, the foundation of philanthropists are used that are lower in rank, but very rich. I want to keep it short, so I will show you the three most important ones that connect all industries in the world. They are the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Open Society Foundation of the controversial multi-billionaire Soros, and the Clinton Foundation. I will give you a very short introduction to show you their power. According to the website of the World Economic Forum, the Gates Foundation is the biggest sponsor of the WHO. That was after Donald Trump quit USA financial support to the WHO in 2020. So the Gates Foundation is one of the most influential entities in everything that concerns our health. The Gates Foundation works closely with the biggest pharma companies, among which are Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, BioNTech and Bayer. And we have just seen who their biggest shareholders are. Bill Gates was not a poor computer nerd who miraculously became very rich. He's from a philanthropist family that works for the absolute elite. His Microsoft is owned by Vanguard, BlackRock and Berkshire Hathaway. But the Gates Foundation, after BlackRock and Vanguard, is the biggest shareholder in Berkshire Hathaway. He was even the member of the board there. We would need hours if we wanted to uncover everything in which Gates, the Open Society Foundation of Soros and the Clinton Foundation are involved. They form a bridge to the current situation, so I had to introduce them. We need to start the next topic with a question. Someone like me who never makes videos can with an old laptop objectively show that only two companies hold a monopoly in all industries in the world. My question is, why is this never talked about in the media? We can choose daily between all sorts of documentaries and TV programs, but none of them cover this subject. Is it not interesting enough? Or are there other interests at play? Wikipedia again gives us the answer. They say that about 90% of the international media is owned by nine media conglomerates. Whether we take the monopolist Netflix and Amazon Prime, or enormous concerns that own many daughter companies like Time Warner, the Walt Disney Company, Comcast, Fox Corporations, Bertelsmann and Viacom CBS, we see that the same names own the stocks. These corporations not only make all the programs, movies and documentaries, but also own the channels on which those are broadcast. So not only the industries, but also the information is owned by the elite. I will show you briefly how this works in the Netherlands. To start with, all the Dutch mainstream media are owned by three companies. The first one is the Persgroep, the parent company of the following brands. Apart from the many newspapers and magazines, they also own Sanoma, the parent company of some of the big commercial Dutch channels. Many media outlets from abroad, like VTM, are also owned by the Persgroep. The second one is Media House, one of Europe's biggest media concerns. In the Netherlands, Media House owns the following brands. 
Until 2017, also Sky Radio and Radio Veronica were owned by Media House, as were Radio 538 and Radio 10. And then there's Bertelsmann, which is one of the nine biggest media firms. This company owns RTL that owns 45 television stations and 32 radio stations in 11 countries. But Bertelsmann is also co-owner of the world's biggest book publisher, Penguin Random House. The stocks of these companies are owned by private funds of three families. Those are the Belgian Van Tillo family, the Belgian Leysen family and the German Bertelsmann Mohn family. All three families sided with the Nazis in the war, according to Wikipedia. For this reason, the Telegraaf, the Leysen newspaper, was temporarily forbidden in the Netherlands after the war. To complete this overview, look at where the news comes from. The daily news of all these media outlets, the diverse news media, do not produce news. They use information and footage from the press agencies AMP and Reuters. These agencies are not independent. ANP is owned by Talpa, John de Mol. Thomson Reuters is owned by the powerful Canadian Thomson family. The most important journalists and editors working for these agencies are a member of a journalism agency like the European Journalism Centre. These are one of the biggest European sponsors of media-related projects. They educate journalists, publish study books, provide trainee spaces and press agencies, and work closely together with the big corporations Google and Facebook. For journalistic analysis and views, the big media use Project Syndicate. This is the most powerful organization in the field. Project Syndicate and organizations like I mentioned are together with the press agencies the link between all worldwide media outlets. When news anchors read from their audio cues, chances are that the text stems from one of these organizations. That is the reason that worldwide media shows synchronicity in their reporting. Plaguing our country. The sharing of bias and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same stories simply aren't true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 And look at the European Journalism Centre itself. Again, the Gates Foundation and the Open Society Foundation. They are also heavily sponsored by Facebook, Google, the Ministry of Education and Science and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Who sponsors the organization and press agencies that produce our news? With Project Syndicate, we see the BMGF, 
the Open Society Foundation and the European Journalism Center. The organizations that bring the news get paid by non-profit organizations of the same elite that also owns the entire media. But also a part of taxpayers' money is used to pay them. In Belgium there are protests regularly since Media House and the Paris Group receive millions of euros from the government, while many are abroad. As a closing note, we take our Dutch public broadcasting service, MPO. Criticism that it is a mouthpiece of the government, that in itself could be a mouthpiece of the big corporation, is not unfounded. The chairman of the supervisory board of the MPO is Chibbe Joustre. He wrote the electoral platform for the VVD, a right-wing liberal party. Former VVD leader Ed Nijpels was chairman of Avrotros. VVD legislator Erik van den Burg is chairman of the NTR. Former chairman of the VVD Bas Eenhoorn is now chairman of VNL. Former PvdA State Secretary Martijn van Dam controls the distribution of benefits to the MPO and sits in the board of the MPO. Former chairman of the PvdA is now in the supervisory board of the VARA. CDA politician Paul Roep is chairman of the supervisory board of CARO and CRV. The partner of D66 minister Ollegren, Irene van Brekel, is editor-in-chief of the news comedy Lubach. Former news anchor Pia Dijkstra is now a member of parliament for D66. Well, this was a lot to chew on, and I tried to make it as short as I could. I only used examples that I thought were necessary to create a clear overview. This helps to better understand our current situation, that can shed new light on past events. There will be enough time to dive into the past, but now let's talk about today. But my goal is to inform you about the danger we are in now. The elite governs every aspect of our lives, also the information we get, and they depend on a coordination cooperation to connect all industries in the world to serve their interests. This is done through the World Economic Forum, among others, a very important organization. Every year in Davos, the CEOs of big corporations meet national leaders, politicians and other influential parties like UNICEF and Greenpeace. In the supervisory board of the WAF is former President Al Gore, our own Minister Kaag, Fijke Seibsma, Chairman of the Royal Dutch State Mines and the Commissioner of DNB, the Dutch Bank. Christine Lagarde, chairwoman of the European Central Bank. Also politician Vert Grapperhaus son works for the WEF. Wikipedia says that the annual fee for members is X euros. But over half of her budget comes from partners who pay the cost for politicians who otherwise could not afford membership. Wikipedia also mentions this. According to critics, the WEF is for rich businesses to do business with other businesses or with politicians. For most members, the WEF would support personal gain instead of being a means to solve the world's problems. Why would there be many world problems if the industry leaders, bankers and politicians from 1971 onwards have gathered every year to solve the world's problems? Isn't it illogical that after 50 years of meetings between environmentalists and the CEOs of the most polluting companies, nature is gradually doing worse, not better? That those critics are right is clear when we look at the main partners that together make up more than half of the budget of the WEF.
because these are BlackRock, the Open Society Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and many big companies from which Vanguard and BlackRock own the stocks. Chairman and founder of the WEF is Klaus Schwab, a Swiss professor and businessman. In his book The Great Reset, he writes about the plans of his organization. The coronavirus is, according to him, a great opportunity to reset our societies. He calls it building back better. The slogan is now on the lips of all globalist politicians in the world. The moment, the crucial moment to rebuild the future, to reset our policies. We also want to work together on building back better. I call it build back better. But the COVID-19 pandemic can also be a moment for resolving long-standing conflicts and addressing structural weaknesses. It's certainly a major crisis but it also offers us a unique opportunity. Four sets of priorities can guide the response to build back better. To build back a better world. But also to build back better. This pandemic has provided an opportunity for a reset. And achieve the sustainable development goals. Our old society must switch to a new one, says Swab. The people own nothing but work for the state to have their primary needs met. The WEF says it's necessary. For the consumption society the elite forced upon us is not sustainable anymore. Schwab says in his book that we will never return to the old normal. And the WEF published a video recently to make clear that by 2030 we will own nothing but we will be happy. You probably heard of the New World Order. The media wants us to believe that this is a conspiracy theory, yet it has been talked about by leaders for decades. George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton and Nelson Mandela, but also world famous philanthropists like Cecile Rhodes, David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger and even George Soros. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a New World Order. A world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. The UN presented in 2015 her controversial Agenda 2030. It is almost identical to the Great Reset of Klaus Schwab. The UN wants to make sure, as does Schwab, that in 2030 poverty, hunger, pollution and disease no longer plague the earth. Sounds nice, but wait till you read the small print. The plan is that Agenda 2030 will be paid by us, the citizens. Just like they ask of us now to give away our rights for public health, they will ask us to give away our wealth to battle poverty. These are no conspiracy theories, it is on their official website. It comes down to this. The UN wants taxes from Western countries to be split by the mega corporations of the elite to create a brand new society. The new infrastructure because fossil fuels are gone in 2030. For this project, the UN says we need a world government, namely the UN itself.
The UN agrees with Schwab that a pandemic is a golden chance to accelerate the implementation of Agenda 2030. It is worrisome that the WEF and the UN openly admit that pandemics and other catastrophes can be used to reshape society. We must not think lightly about this and do thorough research. On Friday, October 18th, 2019, months before the pandemic was announced, a gathering was held in the Pierre Hotel in New York City. It was a meeting for very important persons. Present were politicians, highly credited health experts and pharmacologists. The goal of the gathering was the simulation of a worldwide pandemic. Could be a coincidence, right? But as an example, they used the coronavirus. The simulation covered how the virus would develop and how it could only be detained if people cooperated in industries, governments and government agencies. Again, a new world order to save us. Is it surprising when I tell you that this gathering, Event 201, was organized by the World Economic Forum, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Johns Hopkins Institute? This is no conspiracy theory. Look on the official website of Event 201. At this point you may not be surprised anymore that the Robert Koch Institute, just like any other public institute, is closely connected to Gates WHO and that it created a similar simulation in 2012. Just like in Event 201, they took a coronavirus as an example. In this simulation, the starting point was a food market in Southeast Asia. A coronavirus would jump from an animal to a human. In the simulation, it takes some weeks for the Chinese to discover the virus. In this way, it can spread all over the world. A simulation is made of the next three years of lockdowns, destroyed economies and the impacts on society, riots and protests included. I won't go into the details, look it up on the website of the German government. Lastly, I would like to show you part of a talk of virologist Mark van Ranst, which he held on January 22nd, 2019 in Chatham House. The Chatham House organization is financed by the elite corporations and also by the Gates Foundation. This is an important non-profit in London where important figures gather to talk about the world's problems. The Chatham House Prize was given to Hillary Clinton, Melinda Gates and John Kerry. During the talk, our own Up Osterhaus is in the front row. Van Rans explains how he misled the people during the swine flu. He triggered fear by death numbers without context and media manipulation. He laughs as he tells how he made sure that the vaccines of the pharmaceutical companies he was working for then were accepted by many fearful people. To tell you about my experiences being the, the crisis manager, the flu commissioner for, for Belgium and, and, and highlighting the communication uh, aspects there. And then you have one opportunity to do it right. I mean, day one is so important. Uh, in day one, you start your communication with the press, with the people, and, uh, and you have to do it right. I mean, you have to go for one voice, one message. In Belgium, they chose to uh, appoint a non-politician to do that. I mean, I have no party affiliations, and that makes things a little bit, at that time at least, a little bit easier, because you're not, you're not attacked <laughs> politically, majority, minority. Uh, that doesn't come into play, and that was a huge advantage. The second advantage is that you can play in Brussels the complete naive guy and, uh, and get a lot more done than you would otherwise be, uh, be able to do. You have to be omnipresent that first day or the first days so that you attract the media attention, uh, you, you make an agreement with them that you will tell them all, and if they call, you will pick up the phone. When you do that, then you can profit from these early days to, uh, to get complete carpet coverage of the field, and they're not going to search for alternative voices there. And if you do that, that makes things uh, a lot easier. And then you have to say, okay, well, we will have H1N1 debts. Of course, that would be unavoidable. Uh, I used there Sir Donaldson's uh, quote where he said that in the UK, 
by the peak of the epidemic, 40 people would die uh, per day uh, at the end of the summer. Uh, so 62 at that time, million people in UK, 40 deaths a day. I worked it out for Belgium. That would be seven deaths a day at the peak of the epidemic. I used that in the media. Seven Belgian flu uh, deaths per, uh, per day at the peak of the epidemic would be realistic. That is true in every year, even interpandemically. <laughs> That, that, that is very, very conservative. <laughs> However, talking about fatalities is important because when you say that, people say, wow, what do you mean? People die because of influenza? And that was a necessary step to, uh, to take. And then, of course, a couple of days later, you had the first uh, H1N1 death in the country. And the scene was set and it was already talked about. And then you had to pick uh, who is going to be vaccinated first. Huh? And then, well, women and children first, whatever. I mean, risk groups, they were important. And then I misused the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the top, top football soccer clubs in Belgium um, inappropriately uh, and against all uh, agreements vaccinated their, uh, they made their soccer players priority people. So I said, I can use that. Because if the, the population really believes that this, this vaccine is so desirable that even the soccer players would be dishonest to get their vaccine. Uh, I, I said, okay, I can, I can play with that. So I made a big fuss about this. This is Van Ranst is, uh, is raving mad. Uh, <laughs> but, but it worked. We could talk for hours about the virus of which the survival rate is 99.98% and about the incomprehensible rules that destroy our society. Millions of entrepreneurs are broke. Countless people died in loneliness, in care homes, separated from their families. This is no life. But we know enough facts now that place the corona rules in a much clearer perspective. The perspective of the elite. Big BlackRock and Big Vanguard do not benefit from borders, import taxes and real diversity. Only by means of fear and media manipulation can they contain us. The elites not going to cure us from the diseases we got from their toxic foods or from the environmental pollution. If we did not get sick, the pharmaceutical industry would collapse. Nothing sells better than fear is the slogan of virologists like Van Ranst. You're going to be surprised like I was that we have often been warned. I think we're being run by maniacs. If, if anybody can put on paper what our government and the American government, etc., and the Russian, Chinese, what they are actually trying to do, you know, I think they're all insane. You know, but I'm liable to be put away as insane for expressing that. You know, that's what's insane about it. With this video, I reach out and hope to bridge the ever-growing gap between us. Thank you for listening. I hope in a free future we will remember this time as a unique moment in human history. It will be a tough journey, but we will travel together. We will help each other when we fall and we will not be fearful. We are the 99%.